bring it down just around about this point there. So that, that, of course, is Deep Purple and Perfect Strangers by the line. End of 1973, Deep Purple Mark II was no more. Ian Gillen had been replaced by David Coverdale on vocals, whilst Roger Glover had been replaced by Glenn Hughes on bass and vocals. It left the nucleus of Richie Blackmore, John Lord and Ian Pace to take the purple into a new direction, which eventually came to a halt in the Mark IV lineup in 76. Are you following me thus far? Jolly good. Anyway, with uh, when uh, with albums such as Deep Purple and Rock, uh, Fireball, Machine Heads, etc., many fans hoped to see the classic Mark II lineup uh, come together again. And b- believe it or not, they did. But be careful what you wish for, because it is it is the subject of a new book called Perfect Strangers: Deep Purple, 1984 to 1993, and it's written by our old friend of the show, uh, Laura Shenton. Laura, good afternoon to you. Hi, hello, happy Friday. <laughs> Absolutely. We meet again. You're, you're just turning the books out left, right and centre. Um, this is a really interesting one, isn't it? Because is it a case that you, you, you can't reignite the past, even though you'd really like to? Yeah, I think when Deep Purple Mark II got back together, it was the mid 80s Mm. and the entire landscape of popular music had changed and they were no longer, you know, doing what was considered the premium style of genre by that point. They were already taking the risk in the sense that, you know, would their sound work for the 80s? In the 70s, they had that advantage in the sense that the music they were making was very popular anyway. That's not to say that it was completely easy for them. They had to work work at it of course but um the 80s it was a whole different ball game and for fans there was such an expectation as well because you'd had that you had not had that new that new wave of heavy metal coming in with iron maiden uh with Def leopard etc but much more punky and and then of course the sort of um blackmore had, had of course had rainbow as well so it all been very interesting what they were doing and becoming a bit more poppy so it was it was an interesting situation in the 80s and it the 84 sort of just on the cusp of what would be known as big hair metal. Yeah, that's right. So even um, with magazines like Kerrang! and Metal Hammer, the music being championed was was very much kind of like in the hair metal direction. Um, so new bands rather than, um, you know, the old bands were still respected. Um, Deep Purple was still given plenty of respect. But even by, you know, 1991, they were being referred to as dinosaurs by Kerrang! So it was, it was difficult for Deep Purple, not just in terms of the pop music chart that was going on, um, but in terms of what people expected from their rock music by then as well. It must be difficult to get, because when you have some of the greatest selling albums and singles of all time, and you have absolutely wiped the floor with, with most of the, the opposition, Led Zeppelin notwithstanding, but they obviously they'd finished by sort of 19, 1980, then it, it, it's difficult to get, get the formula going again and getting the enthusiasm. I mean, they'd all tried, you know, they'd, they'd been sort of, uh, you know, John Lord had been off to do a few bits and pieces. Richie Blackmore had had Rainbow and other uh, things as well. So it wasn't as if they... Uh, they weren't still creating. They weren't just sitting around in the mansions, were they? Yeah, that's right. And in the book, I've gone into a lot of detail about what it was for each member of Deep Purple Mark II to, you know, go and be Deep Purple again in 1980, because I think there were different things at stake for different musicians. So, um, like you say, Blackmore had Rainbow, and arguably that was probably the biggest thing that any of the lineup had to give up. Um, you know, John Lord had sort of finished with um, White Snake, so had Ian Pace. Um, Ian Gillan was at a loose end because he'd just done a stint in Black Sabbath. And of course, Roger Glover had been working with Blackmore anyway in Rainbow. So um, there was a lot of debate as to whether, oh, you know, would Blackmore give up Rainbow? And even in interviews around 1984, he was saying, oh, you know, it's just on hold, um, which of course wasn't feasible um, as the demise of being with Deep Purple came more to the fore. Yeah, and, and again, it's it's like kind of like when, when you mentioned Sabbath, uh, 10 years since um, 13 came out, believe it or not, uh, but there was that huge expectation when they all got back together again after a period of time, and I remember seeing you know, the video uh, of it coming out, it was some, they're more sort of meeting up and smiling and shaking hands. Was, was that sort of the, the reality of it, or was, because Blackmore isn't, isn't very feely touchy, is he? Let's face it. 
Yeah, that um, that video, um, that they, the footage they used for the Perfect Strangers video, um, it was actually filmed just by somebody who was there when they were actually working on that album. And I think they were genuinely happy to be back together. Um, I don't think they'd have done it if there wasn't that enthusiasm. I mean, when they had their first jam, they, they all said, oh, it was brilliant. It was just like old times. It was fantastic. Um, but I think as that reunion continued, it got a bit messy. I mean, Perfect Strangers was really at the end of 1984 um the band were happy with it it did well commercially the tour was brilliant it was only topped by um bruce sting spring uh, springsteen that's, that's the fellow <laughs> you may have heard of him yeah indeed <laughs> And, um, you know, that, so that was a great album for them. It, it, it did everything they wanted to and the rest. And, and they all said, you know, they were very surprised and very humbled at how well it did because it wasn't something they took for granted that it was going to do. But by the, their second um, reunion album, the, um, the House of Blue Light, which came out in 1987, mm. things weren't as good. You know, they weren't as happy to agree on what tracks were going to go on the album. Um, I think the rapport had kind of hit that wall that they'd had um, in the 1970s when working on Who Do We Think We Are? You know, the the excitement had kind of waned a bit and, you know, personalities and egos were all coming into that. And that's not just my assumption. They were very candid even at the time in when talking to the press about that. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because 1987... Uh, when the, the album comes out, I mean, it's the high watermark uh, in, you know, in, when we talk about their, not changing their, their image and their style of writing, uh, the style of musician, you know, of craftsmanship so much. Uh, but if you just look across the pond in 1987, David Covered has got white snake and the snake and it's, it's all big hair and, and, and models leaping across cars and there's, there's also, and, you know, Def Leppard have gone completely Californian as well. Yeah, it's fascinating that that whole year, actually, in terms of the purple narrative, because whilst um, the original Mark II lineup were having a pretty bad time of it with the House of Blue Light, um, like you say, you had David Coverdale, who was like... A- doing an amazing, amazing things with Whitesnake. And there's, it's nice in terms of how, you know, Whitesnake in 1984 was having a pretty bad time of it. Coverdale was at a bit of a crossroads. And I do think it's interesting to consider, and I've gone into lots of detail about this in the book, as to what a reunion Deep Purple would have been like with David Coverdale um, fronting the band. Because <laughs> Mark III was a very, you know, a very respected lineup. Um, a lot of people liked it, but I, I, I'm i kind of pleased that David Coverdale did the whole White Snake thing because his 1987 album is amazing, really. Yeah, I- I- indeed. But but I mean, whilst White Snake might have been, you know, the the the, the, the major the major carrier of that sort of big head that we we got bands like what was it Nelson and Cinderella and Motley Crue so you know it can't all be uh it can't be all be sort of sweetness and light and then of course it, we've got the the final album and that comes out in 1993 and and of course the whole the whole musical uh musical scenario the scenery has completely changed because we've got grunge you, we, you know because we've got we've got Nirvana and um and Soundgarden and you know Crush it and Pearl Jam and it's it's a complete different sound it's a completely different type of rock yeah that's right so i think when deep purple were doing their thing in the 80s um they were sort of you know in with you know against the hair metal lot and by the early 90s rock music had gone even further from what it was in the 70s like you say with the grunge and nirvana and you could argue that a you know, Deep Purple weren't, inverted commas, cool by then. Um, and they, they also struggled to sort of sell tickets um, for the live shows. Um, there were a lot of dates that were cancelled. And some people say that, um, you know, when Richie Blackmore broke his finger um, during the House of Blue Light tour and dates were cancelled thereafter, it, you know, obviously that's nobody's fault, but the interest in the band waned and they never really picked up um, that interest in the States um, thereafter, really. It's an interesting lesson, and of course, uh, there is the temptation to keep touring and keep gigging and keep going out. So, what was was it? Um, the Battle of Registon that they thought, right, we've run out of steam now, and we've been doing this for a very long time, uh, and we'd like to sort of you know take our bow and, and retire to our, our various country estates. 
Yeah, even the PR people at the time were basically saying, "Don't don't expect this lineup to be permanent. We we've got no idea what's going to happen now. The album's been released, and now that the tour's happening, um, you know." And it could have even been that Ian Gillan left the band again following that album. Um, there, nothing was set in stone to say, you know, who was going to leave, who was going to get booted out. The whole thing could have collapsed, really. And um, it's a shame because it is actually, I, I personally think it's a brilliant album. But um, there, I mean, Richie Blackmore wasn't happy. He he referred to it as the cattle grazes on, um, <laughs> just to express the tedium of how he felt about the whole thing. And it's, you know, we look at it now and think, well, it, it was inevitable that he was going to leave, but not necessarily. And, and the book's gone into a lot of detail about the, um, the difficulties that everybody had um, in kind of getting to that point, really. And um, what's interesting is what was said at the time is, is considerably different to um, what, we now accept as as facts now. Okay, um, in, in in what way were they saying we you know we we don't want to be doing the same old thing or we're keeping true to our roots or were they saying you know, we we want to become more you know, not down with the kids but you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean Ian Gillan said, well, I'm not too invested in Deep Purple right now because I've, I've already been booted out once. Um, <laughs> so so there was a feeling in the press at the time that he could have been the one to leave. Um, but none of them were really talking about making a change in musical direction. They, they were all pretty staunch about the fact that, you know, we're Deep Purple, this is our sound, take it or leave it. I mean, I'm paraphrasing that. But I, I think for the fans of the band, it, it is good that they didn't kind of, inverted commas, sell out and completely change their sound. Because they said that with the House of Blue Light, they, they actually regretted doing that. You know, there was more of a synthesized keyboard thing going on. It was a lot more heavily produced um, than Perfect Strangers and the Battle Rages on. Yeah, but then again, you see, the thing with that is, is because, you know, Pro Tools and Digitals and CDs have come out and everybody's mucking around with it. I mean, it's all very odd to say 30 years later, oh, yeah, well, they shouldn't have done that, and they should have kept the the sound more orga- organic and vinyl and valved. But this this was a new thing, and you know nobody thought it would lead to you know one hit wonders playing in their bedrooms and not doing live gigs. But at the time, sort of pro tools and drum machines were really amazing things. Yeah, I actually really like that sound on um, on the House of Blue Light. I mean, Mitzi Dupree, that's a track that they had a lot of debate as to whether to include it in the album. And it was probably only salvageable because once Blackmore had done, you know, he'd played it and he said, I'm not doing it again. It was probably more easier to salvage because they had the technology to sort of, you know, do all the multi-tracking um, with that. So I, I think it's good that bands experiment. I, I think it'd be very strange if they didn't (laughs) i think it's in their nature isn't it to develop their sound i mean when you look at deep purple in rock that's so different to the first three albums that mark one did yeah but of course because you want you you pretty much you you, i know you would you would like your your band to evolve a little bit i mean it's great to go see budgie or saxon or or judas priest uh but you kind of know what you're going to get so with somebody who who was uh you know broke out of the mold like deep purple did it you know you, you expect them not to sort of sit back and relax and do the same sort of hoary old stuff now again and again and again yeah, and I think, you know, some bands in the 80s, they, they did suffer, um, you know, not adapting or indeed adapting too much. I mean, if you look at Jethro Tull's no, 1984 album, Under Wraps, that is so different to Songs from the Wood. But, um, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's it's a tricky one for a lot of bands, I think, to strike that balance between being fresh and, and not alienating their, their loyal fan base who have come to expect a certain sound. And that is the thing, isn't it? Because it, it, as, as I always say, rock fans are, are fans like no other because they will absolutely follow you to the ends of the earth. And you, you know, as long as Deep Purple did go off an, an entirely Spinal Tap type jazz odyssey, then they would, you know, they're going to stick with them. Yeah, I think by by the um, the eighties in particular, Deep Purple was so Spinal Tap. I mean, you you sort of look at the arguments they had, um, and yeah, they there was that thing about a lot of bands do become a parody of themselves. But I think that's endearing. I, I think the humour about that kind of is testament to how endearing that is. Yeah, and not only that though. But I mean, I saw I saw Deep Purple in God two thousand and. Eight or 2010 um, in, in a ball ring in Spain and absolutely packed. I mean, we couldn't, it was, you know, we couldn't speak for days after because our eardrums were blown. And the, the, <laughs> there is, you know, and it, and it was, you know, the lineup was brilliant and everybody had a great time. 
Oh, that's brilliant. And that's the thing. They kept going. I mean, everybody said, oh, Blackmore's left. That's it. It's the end. It's over. But they have actually kept going, um, you know, across various lineups to this day. I mean, they're, they're literally still on tour as we speak, um, playing some of the classics and new songs. And a lot of bands are now, aren't they? And I, I, I think that's fantastic. You know, the longevity. Not only that, it has, it has also it inspired and influenced a, a whole raft of, of Deep Purple tribute bands. And I must say hello to the fine men and, and women of Deeper Purple, because they're one of my favourites and, uh, you know, massive fans. And, and they go out and tour and they, and they still get some, uh, huge amounts of, uh, of followers and fans. Yeah, and it's brilliant because, you know, in the 70s, a lot of this was all new and nobody had a crystal ball. Nobody knew that, you know, people would want that music sort of 50, 60 years later. Um, so when reunions happened in the 80s, it was still a bit controversial because people had no idea that, you know, they thought, oh, it's just a money grab. It's just a bit of a flash in the pan thing. So I think in the 80s, you had a lot more cynicism um, when a band did get back together compared to now when a band just keeps on going. It's an interesting, and it must be interesting to write about this because you could always, you, you know, you if if you write it sort of with rose-coloured spectacles, then it, you know the eighties were a wonderful decade, and and, uh, and and that sort of thing, and it was great to see the back together. But you you have to say you have to give give it how it really was, and and also how the how the albums were um, how the albums were received. Yeah, definitely. And the reviews are really interesting. I mean, for writing the book, I, I went through loads of vintage resources and um, the, the reviews are so mixed with each album, um, you know, and the journalists often state their position as being like a long term fan who feels very disappointed that it's not machine head anymore. Um, you know, you get people who are a bit more open to the new ideas. So, yeah, the books included lots of vintage interviews that kind of um, review, sorry, that really sort of go into detail detail about how the albums were received because it was it was so hit and miss with all the all of them really just laura what do you hope that people take from this book um perfect strangers I hope that it reopens the train of thought in terms of exploring was the 1980 deep 1984 deep purple reunion a good idea yes or no was it literally a group of five strangers who really shouldn't have been working together or musically is there something that could have been taken from that that will you know add to their legacy overall Laura if people want to find you online uh, I know you're out there so how can they how can they find you online um, if you Google me, I will turn up. Um, I've also got an author page um, if you want to keep up with all the little details there. And it's just Laura Shenton, author, and that's on Facebook. The book is called Perfect Strangers, Deep Purple, 1984 to 1993. It's by Laura Shenton. I think we should, we'll probably try and get you back on to talk about the dolphin next time, Laura. Uh, the book is called <laughs> Perfect Strangers, and it will be available as a virtual download from our own virtual bookstore. Laura, thank you so much for your time today. Have a great weekend. Thank you.